Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. This is Ariel. She's making a very brief appearance. She is not uh, a camera hog. She does not like to be on the camera too much, but she also likes attention, so she wanted to be here a little bit. Today, we're talking about uh, the Q&A video for idea number 18, which was Adams. This is another one where I didn't have any big hidden agenda that I wanted to use the Q&A video to fill in for, but we did get a lot of good questions, so let's dive right into those. Uh, one question here is, how do quarks, like the up quark and the down quark, fit inside protons? Now you might think, not a problem, there are three tiny little quarks. Why should it be difficult? But remember that the Compton wavelength of a particle, lambda, is one over the mass in units where h bar equals c equals one, natural units, right? So the heavier the particle, the smaller the Compton wavelength. Now, the mass of the up quark is around two million electron volts. The mass of the down quark is around four million electron volts. And the mass of the proton is around 938 MeV, million electron volts. That makes perfect sense when you say the words, uh, the quarks are inside the proton. It would be weird if the quarks were heavier than the proton, right? Uh, and then they're held together by some other energy, and that other energy from quantum chromodynamics goes into making up most of the mass. But what about when you think about the wavelengths, right? Uh, the proton has a smaller Compton wavelength than the quarks do. Right? So how is that possible? Well, remember, the Compton wavelength is not precisely the size of the particle, or even approximately so. That's not what the Compton wavelength is quite about. We do sometimes use it that way informally. Ariel's complaining in the background. Uh, we use it sometimes that way informally, but it's, it's best a rough guide. The point is that, you know, it depends on the physical situation that the particle is in, how to relate the Compton wavelength to its actual extent of the wave function, which is what really matters. So in a hydrogen atom, for example, the wave function of the electron is spread over the Bohr radius, which is related to the Compton wavelength, but is bigger than it. It's bigger than it by one over the fine structure constant. And that's a reflection of the fact that the electromagnetic force that is binding the electron to the proton in the hydrogen atom allows the electron to spread out a little bit. It's a fairly weak force because alpha, the fine structure constant, is a small number, one over 137. So the actual radius of the wave function of the electron is bigger than its Compton wavelength would it be. In the proton, that's a very different situation. A proton is two up quarks and a down quarks. That's something we usually say, but the reality is the proton is a complicated mess of quarks and gluons. So the fact that if, if a, it's true that the up quarks and the down quarks in the proton or the neutron for that matter are squeezed into a size smaller than their Compton wavelength, but it's not that it's impossible to squeeze a particle into a radius smaller than its Compton wavelength. It's that the Compton wavelength is the smallest radius at which you can still think of it as just a single particle. If the wavelength of the particle becomes smaller than its Compton wavelength, then the energy in that particle becomes great enough to make new particles. So it's no longer a good approximation to think of it as just a single particle. Remember the whole journey we took from quantum field theory to particles has situations where you start sort of in the vacuum and then you perturb it a little bit and you find out that it kind of behaves like one or two or three particles. So when you take that particle and squeeze it to a small enough size that it's smaller than its Compton wavelength, the fieldiness kicks in. And you can think of it in some way as the, there are contributions from virtual particles, from particle-antiparticle pairs popping in and out of existence. And so if you're trying to squeeze the up and down quarks into a region smaller than the proton, by the way, there's gluons in there too, and their masses are zero. So you should, could ask this question about them too. But uh, what this means is that you should expect that the two up quarks and the down quark in the proton are not sort of flying around in empty space, or they're not even all by themselves inside there. You should expect the proton to be some complicated combination of many quarks, anti-quarks, uh, and gluons and anti-gluons with a total net number of three extra quarks. In fact, these are sometimes called the valence quarks of the proton because in fact, the proton has a lot more going on than just those, just those three quarks. So that's basically why it's okay to squeeze 
the quarks into a region smaller than their Compton wavelength because they're not just single particles all by themselves anymore. And that's what the Compton wavelength is all about. This cat is not gonna let us get through this video. Um, all right, the next question was, again, I always uh, translate the questions a little bit, sorry about that, but why isn't there neutronium? Neutronium uh, might be the name. I've never heard the word neutronium before. I made it up, but it's basically the combination of two neutrons. Neutron, neutron, so this is down, up, down, up, down, down. You know, why can't we just get two neutrons together into a stable kind of nucleus? Because we said that a neutron by itself, heavier than the proton, it will eventually decay. But when you put it together with a proton, then there's a binding energy there that is negative. And so it turns out that the mass of the deuteron, one proton and one neutron, is less than the mass of uh, the proton and neutron by themselves. So there's nowhere for the, or even two protons by themselves. So there's nowhere for the deuteron to decay into. But if you had neutronium, there's an obvious place for it to decay into, namely uh, a deuteron, right? Uh, a proton with two ups and a down and a neutron with one up and two downs, okay? The strong interaction is basically the same for these two things, two neutrons put together, two, one neutron and one proton put together. The electromagnetic interaction is more or less zero in both cases because the proton isn't pushing against other protons if there's just one other neutron there. So all the difference between these two things is that here you have two neutrons and the neutrons are heavier than the protons. So the deuteron is definitely going to be lighter than neutronium if there were such a thing, and therefore the neutronium would quickly decay. So that's, I do this, in, I did this in some detail because it's a good example of the way that we're supposed to be thinking about these things, right? You say, well, why doesn't this exist? Some conglomeration of particles. Well, what can it decay into? Are there interactions that allow it to decay? Are there conservation laws that allow it to decay? And so forth. In this case, if there were neutronium, it would be massive enough that it could just decay into de uh, deuteron right away, pretty quickly. Or maybe even just decay into, you know, two free protons or something like that. Okay, now here's a more subtle one. Um, what breaks the symmetry? Again, my rephrasing of the question. Of a single atom uh, with an electron in a p orbital. I forget whether I actually use that nomenclature, but if you took your chemistry class uh, in high school or college, you've heard the phrase p orbital. The p orbitals are the orbitals that the electron can be in that sort of have this double lobe structure. Oops, I can do better than that. Got to go with strength. You can't just hesitate. Um, so the p orbital is the one where the electron is not in its spherically symmetric lowest energy state. It's in the next highest energy state. And there are three of them because it could be oriented along the z-axis, the x-axis, or the y-axis, right? Three perpendicular axes. So there's it's inhomogeneous. It's not spherically symmetric. And there are three of them times two because there are two spin states for the two electrons. There's six total ways for the electrons to be in this p orbital. And so the question is, if you just had one atom with one uh, such electron, right? Uh, and it was out there in the world in empty space, let's say, um, who picks which one it is? If it just has one electron, if it's in the z direction or the x direction or the y direction, you know, how do you know which one it's going to be in? So there's actually two answers to this. This is a very good question. There's two answers to it. Um, one is, you know, there's nothing to stop it from breaking the symmetry. It's nothing to stop it from just saying, uh, I'm in the state of the p orbital moved in, is aligned in the x direction, right? I mean, that's just how it is. Uh, there's plenty of things, like, like if you had a hydrogen uh, molecule, right? If you had two hydrogen atoms, that's a little dumbbell shaped thing. So it, it has a preferred axis and you could easily imagine a hydrogen molecule sitting out there in empty space, violating the symmetry. It would be a random sense in which it violated the symmetry, but it, it could happen. There's nothing that stops that. But the other thing is, which is a little more subtle, which is again, why I thought it'd be an interesting thing to talk about. These, there are three states, six really, if you count the spins, um, for the p orbitals, and they all have exactly the same energy. Right? There's no difference between the energy of the orbital pointed this way versus this way versus this way. And in, uh, so what we call that is a degeneracy. We say that these 
energy states are degenerate. They have exactly the same energies. So if you, the, and the reason why that's interesting is if you have two states that are slightly different in energy than like we just talked about, the heavier one, the one with more energy, will like to decay into the lighter one. And that's a natural thing to have happen. And you can calculate the rate at which that's going to happen, etc. But if they're degenerate, then one's not going to decay into the other. But the point is you could create a state that is any combination of these three, and it would still have the same energy. By combination, I really mean literally a quantum superposition, okay? So we picked out these three states as a basis for what that electron could be doing. The electron, it's exactly like the spin of a single electron could be spin up or spin down, right? That's what we say sometimes. What we mean is those are the two basis states, but the electron can have it spin in any direction, right? You can have a combination of any of those. Um, and the energy would be the same. As long, if, the energy, if the electron were in a magnetic field, then its spin would be lower energy one way and higher energy some other way. But if there's no magnetic field, if the electron's just out there in empty space, all the different spin directions it could point in are created equal. Likewise here, uh, this is not a spin, this is a spatial configuration of the spatial wave function of the electron. So when we say it could be pointed z direction, x direction, y direction, what we really mean is those are the three basis states and the true wave function could be a linear combination, a superposition of any of those and it would still have the same energy. So you could imagine taking all sorts of combinations, you don't need to be fixed to those particular uh, configurations. Physics students, of course, are tortured by this stuff because when you do perturbation theory in atomic and nuclear physics, the rules are slightly more complicated when you have degenerate energy states. Uh, but for us, we're just gonna say they're there and, and you could be in them or, or combinations of them. That's all we're gonna need to say. Okay, uh, here's a more conceptual question. Um, I'm not even sure, quite sure how to say this. Um, how can two fermions, let's say it this way, how can two fermions not have the same wave function? So we said when we were talking about what a fermion is, that the whole point of the fermion was that a fermion, two identical fermions cannot be in the same quantum state, right? And a quantum state is just a synonym for the wave function. In the, Unless you're a Bohmian or hidden variables person, quantum state means the wave function. So the whole point of a fermionic field is that the excitations in that field, the particle-like excitations in that field, are not allowed to be in the same wave function. So when you have some big wave function for two particles, x1 and x2, it typically for a fermion looks like psi1 of x1, psi2 of x2, where psi1 and x2 are different, then minus psi1 of x2 psi 2 of x1. So this guarantees that if you switch x1 and x2, you get minus what you started with. That's what makes it a fermion. And so the question here, I think, if I'm interpreting it correctly, is due to, as usual, a sloppiness of the way that we talk about these things. And the sloppiness of the way that we talk about these things comes down to the same wave function language. So for people who care about the foundations of quantum mechanics and what quantum mechanics is really saying, um, it's an important fact that different par parts of the universe, different particles or different subsets or whatever, do not in principle have separate wave functions. They're all part of the wave function of the universe, by which in this toy example, we would mean this capital Psi, that's the wave function. And then we talk about, but, but in particular special circumstances, we can talk about the individual wave function for a single particle, okay? So here you would be very naturally saying, like let's say you had an electron that was in one atom and another electron that was in totally another atom, okay? The total wave function for those two electrons has to take this kind of form where there's some anti-symmetrization between them because they're fermions and they're identical particles, okay? But Psi one and psi two in that case are completely different things. Psi one is in this atom, psi two is in that atom. The point of this kind of construction is to say, you can't say which electron is in which atom, but you can say there's an electron in this atom and there's an electron in the other atom. 
Does that make sense? There's no label distinguishing the two electrons. So there is, it's not like it's some pre-existing, this electron is named Alice and this electron is named Bob and Alice is in the hydrogen atom and Bob is in the helium atom or something like that. That doesn't make sense. Electrons don't have names, okay? But you can say there is a part of the electron, uh, two electron state that is in the helium atom and another part that's in the hydrogen atom, okay? So very, very often we are therefore sloppy about it. We talk about the wave function of the electron in the hydrogen atom and the wave function of the other one. So we talk about the wave function psi one and the wave function psi two, okay? And psi one and psi two cannot be exactly the same wave function because then this whole thing would just be zero and that's not a very interesting quantum state. So it's a sloppiness of language problem. It's still true for these identical particles for the quantum fields that give rise to them, that if you're careful and you're doing your quantum mechanics and talking about it correctly, you would say that everything is part of the single universal wave function of the universe. But in special circumstances where the wave functions of the individual particles can sensibly be talked about individually, we do that and in the back of our minds, we have all the footnotes and the caveats and saying, but of course it's anti-symmetrized and all that stuff. So there's nothing, there, there's, it's meaningful to say two electrons cannot have the same quantum state and yet those electrons are described by the same quantum state because we mean different things by the words quantum state in those two sentences. In one, we mean the individual wave functions for the two parts of this big wave function, and in the other, we mean the big wave function that means everything. But this, this is good. This is why we're doing the Q&A, because you know, getting exactly right on these details is, is hard to do, because once you've been doing it, once you've been playing with it, you know what you mean when you say these things. Physicists know what they mean when they talk about these things, therefore they can get sloppy. That's just a, uh, you know, occupational hazard, I guess. Okay, um, here's a big one. Flavor violation, not really a question, except what about? Uh, flavor vi violation via neutrino oscillations. Let me explain what this means. So um, we said that the leptons come in three families, right? We have the heaviest one is the tau and the tau neutrino. Then you have the muon and the muon neutrino and the electron and the electron neutrino. When I say the heaviest one, that's clearly true for the muon, the tau, and the electron. We actually, it, it's harder to arrange the neutrinos. We don't know how to do that. In fact, these neutrinos, as I've written them, don't have definite masses. Remember, that's, that's we didn't go into this. We're not going to go into this, uh, but neutrino physics is complicated. There are three mass states for the, elect, for the neutrinos. There's the neutrino number one, neutrino number two, neutrino number three. But the three mass states, states of definite mass, are combinations, mixtures, of what we call the electron neutrino, the tau neutrino, and the muon neutrino. These, uh, these are what we call flavor states, and we know that because that's what are created in interactions. So for example, when you have a, a muon, okay, so a muon traveling along has muon number, and the muon number is going to be conserved in the weak interactions. So what we mean by that is the muon can emit a W minus, turn in, muon is minus, of course, so it turns into a neutrino, and that neutrino had better be a muon neutrino. Oops, not a neutrino neutrino. It's not going to be an electron neutrino or a tau neutrino. In fact, this is what it means to be a muon neutrino. It means that it was the thing that was created by a muon decaying, or it, or it can go backwards. It can actually turn into uh, a muon in the right circumstances. And then this W minus could decay into whatever it wants. It could decay into, well, it's going to decay into a charged lepton or a charged, it could decay into a up quark and a down quark, for example, but it could also decay into, let's say, a tau and then an anti-tau neutrino. And so when you look at these diagrams, um, not only is lepton number, the total number of leptons being conserved, but there are individual conservation laws for the three families, okay? For the, they're sometimes called families or generations. I know that doesn't, that's not consistent nomenclature, but that's what they're called, okay? So we talk about flavor 
which is another, <laughs> it's also called flavors or family number or generations. Actually, is flavor violation the right logo for this? I, I think it is, but you know, honestly, this is not my bag. I do not, I do not get into this nitty gritty of particle physics in my everyday life. So uh, don't, you know, go to Wikipedia to check up on the nomenclature here. But the point is that the electronness, the muonness, the tauness, whatever you want to call them, are conserved in the weak interactions. And so there's, it's an approximate symmetry, but it's not a gauge invariance, notice. There's, remember, we talked about the difference between a global symmetry and a gauge symmetry when we talked about gauge theories. Gauge symmetries are ones where you can rotate systems um, uh, individually at every point in space, and then there's a connection field that has to relate them, and that gives rise to a force of nature. This is a global symmetry that, that keeps all of these uh, lepton numbers individually conserved, but Global symmetries can be broken, you know, they can be broken explicitly, or they can only be approximately true. Gauge symmetries are either there or they're not. You know, you have a connection and you have a force or you don't. But global symmetries can be approximate. So it turns out that these symmetries that keep tauness, muonness, and electronness conserved are only approximate. So under, under the right circumstances, you can have a situation where a muon neutrino, let's say, just oscillates into an electron neutrino. Uh, this is the subject of neutrino oscillations, and the reason why is because neither the muon nor the electron are have a definite mass, right? So they can actually change um, identities into each other without violation, violating conservation of energy or anything like that. The rate at which it happens depends on the environment they move in and the whole bit, but this these processes are crucial for things like the solar neutrino problem, right? We, for a long time, we had these pretty good models of what was going on in the middle of the sun. Not perfect, and there were there were complicated complications that people worried about, but people like John Bacall uh, and others worked out what was going on inside the sun. And of course, when you get you know a neutron and a proton together, and they fuse together to make deuterons, um, actually, let's not say that. When you have two protons and you fuse them together, uh, there's no stable bound state of two protons, but there's one of a proton and neutron, the deuteron. So you have to turn one of those protons into a neutron, and that's the weak interactions at work, and you emit a, a neutrino, you emit a bunch of neutrinos. So neutrinos should come out of the sun if nuclear fusion is going on there. And then when we built uh, experiments to look for them, Ray Davis and other people, they did not find as many neutrinos as they should. The reason why, there's a long story about the reason why, um, MSW effect and all that stuff, but the short answer is neutrinos of one flavor can turn into neutrinos of another flavor. And so the sun was producing electron neutrinos and we were trying to detect electron neutrinos, but they had turned into something else on, along the way. And you might say, but how can that be allowed if you have this, this symmetry or this conservation of electronness, muonness, and tauness? And the answer is you don't. The answer is the weak interactions, this is a weak interaction. Anything that is mediated by a W boson or a Z boson is a weak interaction. And in particle physics, some interactions can conserve certain quantities, while others do not conserve those quantities. So the weak interactions conserve electronness, muonness, and tauness uh, separately. But neutrino oscillations do not, they violate them. But neutrino oscillations are sort of more rare and hard to observe. So if you didn't look very hard, if you didn't do these Nobel Prize winning experiments that uh, Davis and others did, you'd be hard to tell that uh, these different numbers of electronness, muonness, and tauness were being violated in these interactions. So it's just another situation where there's an approximate symmetry, which is pretty good. Notice that for quarks, it's the same story, but much worse. Quarks can actually just violate uh, these symmetries, even in the weak interactions. So you know that there's like the up, down, up quark and down quark are a family, and then charm and strange are a family, and then top and bottom are a family. But there's, there are ways to mix these things together much more easily than you can with the leptons, something called the uh, Kabibo kobayashi maskawa matrix, the CKM mixing matrix explains all that. Again, you can see why we're not gonna get into this. There's a, there's a neutrino mixing matrix, there's a quark mixing matrix, and infinite fun to play with the standard model of particle physics and its, its near neighbors, but we're, we don't have time or, or energy to do that a very good job. The short answer is, these numbers are not completely conserved and the neutrino oscillations are how they're violated. Okay, I may even have mentioned that in the original uh, lecture, but certainly not very clearly. Okay, here's another question. Uh, 
Can there be more than three generations? So here we have three generations of leptons. There's a matching three generations of quarks. Once you've found three, <laughs> it's pretty easy to say, well, okay, how do you know that there are not more? I mean, even finding the three was interesting, right? You know, we, uh, when, probably I've, I've told the story already, but antimatter was discovered by Carl Anderson at Caltech in the 1930s, I think 35. Um, it had been predicted by Paul Dirac once you invented the Dirac equation, you can figure out that if you believe the Dirac equation and take it seriously, if you have a negatively charged particle with a certain mass, there should be a positively charged particle with the same mass and the same properties. And so we knew about the electron, Dirac basically was predicting the positron, but because it was all newfangled and not settled yet, people weren't completely sure whether or not we should take that seriously. Like maybe there was some symmetry breaking and what Dirac was predicting was really the proton, which we already knew about, right? So the prediction of the positron was taken very seriously by some people, less seriously by others. Um, Carl Anderson detected it. He went onto the roof at a building at Caltech, built a cloud chamber, and then from cosmic rays, you know, he didn't have a particle accelerator, he just used cosmic rays coming from the sky to detect a particle that looked exactly like an electron, except it was deflected the other way in a magnetic field. So you knew it had a positive charge. People were so skeptical, some people said like, are you sure you're not holding the picture upside down? This, if you think that it's being deflected the wrong way, they checked, they were not holding the, the picture upside down. So then he very quickly, Anderson very quickly also discovered the muon. So he discovered, and the anti-muon, which is another thing. So these cosmic rays hit the atmosphere. Um, cosmic rays, little digression here. What's going on? Uh, you have the earth, here we are. You have the atmosphere of the earth, right? And then you have, here's Caltech. Here's Carl Anderson on the roof of a building, and he has a little bubble chamber, cloud chamber. I can never keep track which was which. And what happens is a super high energy cosmic ray, which is probably a proton or an antiproton. Sometimes they're heavier nuclei, like a helium nucleus or something like that. Super high energy comes in and hits the atmosphere. And so most of these cosmic rays never get to the ground where you can observe them. But what they do is they hit an atom and then they create a cascade of many different particles, and some of those particles are gonna go into your detector, okay? So a lot of the particles that are produced are muons and anti-muons. So Anderson, as well as electrons and, pro and positrons, so Anderson was able to discover the positron and also the muon and the anti-muon. But at that point, you know, we knew about protons and neutrons, and we knew about electrons and neutrinos, okay? Did we know about neutrinos? I'm not even sure if we knew about neutrinos, to be honest. I forget when those happened, but this this era that we're talking about right now is circa 1935. So the muon was like, literally, this was the thing that uh, that inspired I.I. Uh, I. Robbie to say, who ordered that? <laughs> it was a particle that was just like the electron, but heavier. In fact, it was originally called the mu meson because we were beginning to discover things like pions and other mesons, which we now know the real mesons are quark anti quark pairs. But this was another particle that you know didn't fit in anywhere and it decayed and so forth. So they thought it was another meson, but it's not, it's a lepton. And eventually we realized, okay, it's part of another generation. The electron has its neutrino, the muon has its neutrino. And then we discovered the tau. That was a big deal. Um, in the quark sector, you know, we the up and down quarks were there right away. And the strange quark was also there right away um, because the putting together of the quark model by Murray Gell-Mann and uh, Yuval Neyman and others relied on the fact that there were three different kinds of quarks, up, down, and strange. The discovery of the charm quark took a lot longer. It wasn't until the 70s, not a lot longer, but it wasn't until the 70s that evidence uh, came in favor of that. Glashow and Iliopoulos and Mayani had actually predicted the existence of the charm quark, and uh, Bjorkane had something to do with that also. Again, the details are very messy, but uh, they predicted it because it helped explain the small rate of certain interactions in particle physics, and then it was eventually discovered. But then again, okay, so that's two generations, and then the bottom quark was like a whole other thing. There was a whole other surprise. Uh, I think Leon Letterman uh, and his collaborators get the credit for that. And uh, so all these were surprises. Like the first three generations, the, all I'm trying to say is that 
there was never at the beginning of particle physics a principle that there should be generations at all, right? They kept just being surprising and, discover and being discovered. So we've discovered three generations so far, so far. Therefore, it is completely natural to ask, could there be a fourth? Now, if the, there's, there's sort of a short but cheating answer, if you thought that all neutrinos were very, very low mass, you know, the three neutrinos we know about are much lighter than anything else, right? Much lighter than the electron, which is the next lightest particle. Um, if you thought that the fourth generation included a light neutrino, then it's ruled out. Uh, there's plenty of experiments and even cosmology uh, experiments, the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, for example, that are that would be very, very different if there was a fourth generation of light neutrino. Okay, uh, so that's not true. So there's there's definitely not a third generation that is exactly like the four, the three that we know about. There's not not a fourth generation. Um, of course, you could imagine a fourth generation where even the neutrino was super duper heavy. And there, you know, we don't know for sure. Like maybe there, there could be, but it'd be really weird. Like that neutrino has to be really heavy in order to evade detection. And the charged lepton has to be heavy to, in order to not evade detection. You know, in the uh, Large Hadron Collider, we've been looking, we've been looking for new particles. And, you know, for that matter, at Fermilab. Uh, at the Tevatron at Fermilab before the LAC even turned on. Uh, and at Slack, at Stanford, at other places, we've been looking for new particles. LEP was a particle accelerator at CERN predating the LHC. We haven't found any of these new particles yet. So the smart money is there are only three generations. There's no reason why just because there are three, there have to be an infinite number. In fact, there are versions of string theory where you can explain why there are three generations in terms of the topology of the compact dimensions. That's, that was one of the cool things that got people excited about string theory in the 1980s. Depending on the topology of the compact dimensions, you could actually predict that there should be three. I mean, other topologies would predict a different number, so it's uh, not a very good prediction, but you could explain it, let's put it that way. Um, but we're still looking, and you know, even if you don't find them directly, the limits are very, very good because you can you can look for things indirectly in particle physics. Remember, we have all these um, virtual particles, and so we do we do actually look at processes with the particles that we know about. And even if there are other particles that we haven't detected directly, their existence could affect the rate of the interactions of the particles that we have detected. And we haven't seen that either. So there's very, very good limits on the possibility of more than three generations. Again, can't say for sure, but there, there's no reason for them to be there. Uh, the neutrino would have to be really, really heavy, and we've seen zero evidence. So there's not a lot of people in particle physics thinking hard these days about more than three generations. Could be true, but we haven't thought about it yet, or we haven't found any evidence for it yet. Okay, keep going with more questions. Um, how can this happen. A muon, remember I just showed you this picture of a muon decaying into a neutrino via a W boson, which then itself decays into, let's say, let's put make an electron now. Why not? We'll even put the little arrows because these guys are fermions. And an electron anti-neutrino. So the, the question is, how can this happen? And you might say, well, why, why not? And the answer is, uh, if I do this, if I erase this part, now it looks like the muon has decayed into a W particle and a neutrino, right? And, you know, we <laughs> that can't happen. Why? Because the W is much heavier than the muon, right? You can't, a light particle can't decay into a heavier one. So if you thought that this diagram, which represents the decay of a muon to a neutrino and a W minus, can't happen, then how in the world can this one actually happen, right? Uh, how can the something that you made out of something that can't happen be possible? Well, the answer is that in this diagram, this is a virtual W boson. So remember the rules of virtual particles are they're not really particles. They're a nice mathematical way of talking about the excitations in quantum fields. And they don't have to obey the rules for the relationship between mass and energy. So for this particle, you know, E squared is M squared uh, plus P squared, where this is the momentum, okay? 
this is what's supposed to be true, but for a virtual particle, this is not true. So it has an energy, it has a momentum, but they don't add up to make the mass in exactly this way. So even though the mass of the W boson is heavier than that of the mu, in this kind of diagram, that virtual W can have an energy that is less than the energy of the original muon. So within this diagram, this is completely okay. Um, it's an interesting fact numerically, quantitatively, that diagrams where all the particles are as close to being real as possible. Remember, this is called, this, this expression is called the mass shell condition because if you plot it like this, P, E, this equation looks like this. It's sort of a shell, a hyperboloid up there, okay? And being on the mass shell is when a virtual particle is almost or very close to that particular relationship. So this relationship, E, e squared equals M squared plus P squared is just true for real particles. Uh, you can come close to it, but not be on it if you're a virtual particle. For a virtual particle, this relationship may or may not be true, but what, I guess what I'm saying in a long-winded way is the closer you are to it, the bigger that Feynman diagram is numerically, the stronger the contribution is. If particles can decay through other particles that are close to the mass shell, then that decay is more likely to happen. And this is why certain kind of interactions and certain kinds of decays in particle physics are bigger than you might expect because there's some resonance near a real particle energy. But here, the W particle has to have much less energy than it wants to because of its mass. That's yet another reason why these weak interactions are weak because they're hard to go through a little bit. The W has to be very, very virtual for this to happen. Okay. What's next? Uh, good. For baryogenesis, remember baryogenesis is the idea that in the early universe, maybe uh, there were just as many baryons as antibaryons, or almost just as many quarks and antiquarks, okay? Uh, and they almost all annihilate away, except for one out of a billion. They do not. One out of a billion quarks or antiquarks do not annihilate away, um, leaving us with some excess quarks. And that's why we have more matter than antimatter in the universe. And when they annihilate away, when those quarks and antiquarks annihilate away, uh, they turn into photons, mostly. They turn into other things as well, but eventually they turn into photons. So the question is, where do the photons go? Well, you could ask this question, uh, not just about photon, not, not just about baryons, but about electrons. The same thing is true with electrons. There were almost as many positrons as electrons in the early universe, and they eventually annihilate away. So if you think about it, what you would expect, is this is the very early universe we're talking about here. Um, you have this hot, dense gas full of particles. And remember, temperature is approximately uh, the average kinetic energy of particles. So, and remember energy is mc squared. So if the temperature, which has units of energy, is higher than the mass of a particle in units where c equals one, then you expect those particles and antiparticles to be created and destroyed all the time, right? There's a whole bunch of particles just popping in and out of existence from the ordinary interactions of other particles. And what happens is, as the temperature goes below, um, let me see if I can plot this. Again, making this up as I go along here. So as time goes on here, as the universe expands and cools, the temperature goes down, okay? And so let's say that you have, you know, the mass of some particle, the mass of an electron, let's say. So here's the mass of the electron. There's a temperature. In fact, let's call this two times the mass of the electron because two times the mass of the electron is the mass of an electron and a positron, right? So at temperatures higher than the mass of the electron, there are E minus E plus pairs being created and destroyed all the time because the average energies as two particles colliding together is enough to make an electron-positron pair. 
all the, what I'm saying here now for electrons and positrons goes equally well for quarks and antiquarks. And then below this, there's just photons. So you imagine that all these electrons and positrons are flying around. Sometimes they're annihilating, but sometimes they're being created also, right? So at temperatures higher than their mass, there's an almost equilibrium between particles being created and destroyed. Whereas when you drop below that mass, when the temperature goes so low that you can annihilate particles but not create them anymore, then the particles go away. They just convert into photons. You get something like, uh, there's many different ways to do this, but here's E minus, E plus, the, the positron, uh, and here's a way to Feynman diagram that turns it into two photons, for example. So where, so if this story is true, that in the super early universe, things were hot and dense and there were all sorts of particles flying around of all sorts of different uh, charges and masses and everything. And then as you cool down, there's a series of transitions where those particles annihilate away into photons. The question you're asking is, shouldn't there be this gas of all sorts of photons bouncing around in the universe? <laughs> so I'm saying it in, in, uh, you know, uh, intentionally, provocatively, because yes, there is. It's called the cosmic microwave background. Um, the number of baryons in our observable universe, the excess of baryons over antibaryons, it's about 10 to the 80th baryons in our in our universe, the stars and the gas and the dust and all that stuff. The number of photons in our observable universe is around 10 to the 88th, way more, okay? So roughly speaking, the photons went to form the cosmic microwave background. You know, there, there were roughly speaking similar numbers of photons and baryons before the baryons annihilated away. And when the baryons did annihilate away, they created approximately as many photons as there had been baryons. So you increase the number of photons by a factor of two or something like that. But it's not a big deal. And in fact, it's not even as much as that because there are a whole bunch of different particles that annihilate away and create photons. Baryons are just one of them. So by the time the quarks were annihilating away, there had been a whole other bunch of particles that had already annihilated away, and there were a lot more photons than baryons. So the photons didn't go anywhere. We're observing them today in our telescopes, right? In our microwave background telescopes, in our radio telescopes. So they're still out there suffusing the world around us. Back in the days when people used to not have cable TV, you could say that 10% of the static on your cable TV, came, on your, on your uh, broadcast TV, came from the cosmic microwave background photons. They're just all around us. Uh, some of those were created by baryons annihilating in the early universe. There you go. All right, where are we? Uh, good, we're making progress here. Okay, here's a good one. Two more, two more questions. One is, um, can you have negative mass particles? Can the mass of a particle be less than zero? After all, charges of particles can be positive or negative. Could um, particles have masses less than zero? Well, you could certainly imagine that being true. I mean, this is, again, what theoretical physicists do for living. You say, what if this were true? What would the world be like? So you can imagine particles of masses less than zero. In fact, um, I did this once. <laughs> I wrote a paper with uh, Mark Trodden and um, Mark Hoffman on the question, so there's this idea that, hmm, how much detail should I go into? You remember there's dark energy, right? Dark energy is a big deal. So some people say, well, there could be a dark energy field, a quintessence field, some field phi that has a potential energy and the field is rolling down and the slope of the potential is slow, so gradual that this amount of energy here is almost constant as the universe expands, so it's dark energy. Quintessence. So dark energy, these are two slightly different terms. Remember the vacuum energy is strictly constant energy that can exist in empty space. Dark energy is any kind of energy that is almost constant, maybe not exactly constant, but it could be slowly varying or it could be exactly constant, okay? Quintessence is the particular idea that you could have a form of dark energy where the um, form of energy, the source of energy was a scalar field slowly rolling down its potential, okay? That's the lingo you need to know. So some people, um, Robert Caldwell, Mark Kamienkowski, and some other people said, well, we have an energy density. Rho, remember, is the Greek letter we use for energy density. And we usually say that, that is kinetic 
plus potential. Okay. And we usually say that is uh, 1 half phi dot squared, the time derivative of phi, plus v of phi. So they said, um, what if we imagined, again, this is what we do, what if we imagined uh, a form of energy that they called phantom energy, phantom, which has the, the feature that the kinetic energy is negative, one half minus one half phi dot squared plus v of phi, okay? Because if that were true, I drew this picture here where the field is rolling down its potential, um, but if the kinetic energy were negative, if you go into the equations of motion, what happens is the field would tend to roll up its potential. So in this case, uh, the derivative of the energy density, phantom, over time, remember this needs to be close to zero to be dark energy. You don't want the energy density to be changing that much. But in ordinary quintessence theory, it would gradually decay. In the phantom energy, it would gradually increase. So you get more and more energy over time, and that is what leads to what they call the big rip. So you're imagining it literally in empty space. I mean, it was weird enough just to imagine that an empty cubic centimeter of space has energy in it. What these folks are imagining is that it has energy that is increasing over time, empty space, right? And in a finite amount of time, it can reach an infinite energy, and that would be a singularity in general relativity, and they called it the big rip. So what I did uh, with the two marks is to say, look, let's take this seriously as a theory of particle physics. So you can derive something like this from a Lagrangian, right? And you can quantize it and get particles. And those particles have negative masses. That's exactly what this theory says. This is different from a tachyon. A tachyon particle actually has an imaginary mass and travels faster than the speed of light. This is an ordinary particle in terms of it's not being tachyonic. It doesn't move faster than the speed of light, but it has a negative mass. Here's the problem with that. Remember, we just had a discussion up here about energy conservation and um, particle decays. So the muon can decay into neutrino, electron, antineutrino, because the sum of masses of these folks is lower, right, than the mass of the original um, muon. But if you could have, if you have particles, these phi particles with negative energy, then what you can do is have an electron and it can decay, I'm not going to say exactly how because we don't know how, but it could decay into a muon. So something happens, we don't know exactly what. Electron decays into a muon, you say, how can a light particle decay into a heavier particle? Well, by emitting a particle with mass less than zero, right? So if you have particles with masses less than zero, then light particles can now decay into heavy ones while still maintaining energy conservation. In fact, Here's another thing that could happen. Nothing <laughs> could decay into, let's say, an electron, a positron, and a bunch of phi particles. Literally empty space could decay into some positive mass particles and some negative mass particles. That's bad. In fact, you calculate the rate at which this happens and it's almost instantaneous. Basically, it is instantaneous except for their, you know, you normalize and put a cutoff and stuff like that. So the vacuum empty space is, un oops, is unstable. The reason why empty space is stable in ordinary physics is because every particle, every excitation, everything that you can do to the quantum field increases its energy. Okay, So if energy is conserved and you start with zero energy, there's nowhere to go. If all non-zero energies are positive numbers, if you start with zero energy, nothing's going to happen. But if you can have both positive and negative energies, you can start with zero energy and stay in the zero energy sector in an infinite number of different ways. And so that will happen quantum mechanically, and we don't observe that. The world remains more or less stable. And you can try to fix this, and people did. So, you know, our paper got a lot of citations because people were trying to, you know, wiggle around our conclusion. But the con I think it's basically true. Like, unless you jump through hoops and try really, really hard, negative mass particles are bad. In fact, there's a name for these particles. These are called ghosts uh, because there are 
similar particles that are allowed, but they're sort of only virtual ghosts. If you have real particles that are ghost-like, negative masses, that's generally considered bad. Okay. Um, again, there's no... It's very, very difficult to have absolute impossibilities in particle physics because people are very clever, but that's the way I would bet. All right, final question. Um, testing quantum field theory and new particles. So here, just want to talk for a second. Um, I said at the end of the Adams video, of the, of the last uh, Big Idea video, that the if you believe in quantum field theory, if quantum field theory is more or less correct, then we have discovered all the particles and forces at the microscopic level that are relevant to our everyday lives. There's some nitpicky people who are like, what about dark matter? But you know, dark matter is not part of your everyday life. <laughs> what about quantum computing? Well, quantum computers are made of electrons and protons and neutrons, they are. It's really true, like this is, this is actually true, this, this claim here. I'm not gonna repeat it exactly, but there's one thing that I could have said and, and didn't say just for time constraints, which is, well, this makes sense because what I said was crossing symmetry, right? I said, look, if you have some new particle here, X, and you have electrons and they can interact, then that implies that you can take an electron and a positron and make these X particles, X particles, anti-X particles. So at a particle accelerator, if there were new particles that we hadn't yet discovered that were that interacted with electrons and positrons and protons and neutrons strongly enough, to have an effect on everyday physics, we would have made them already. But there's another thing, which is, well, what about new forces, right? So this, this says no new particles. Well, what about new forces? And you, to, to a large extent, exactly the same argument works, right? Um, but there's a loophole, which is what about, you know, gravity, okay? Gravity is an example of a force that is very weak. You're never going to see gravity at a particle accelerator. So how do you know there's not a new force that extends over macroscopic distances, you know, centimeters or something like that, or longer than larger, anything, anything that, you know, if it's going to be macroscopic, if you're going to be able to bend a spoon with your mind, then it better stretch over at least a few centimeters. More than that is allowed, but less than that becomes useless. Um, you would never have detected the graviton at particle accelerators. You still haven't. So how do you know there's not new forces like that? Well, turns out there are also ways to detect new forces. And here what you're making, taking advantage of is when you think about the force between me and the Apple Pencil, I'm made of electrons, protons, and neutrons. I did make a tiny mistake. I made a big mistake in the video because I said that beryllium was element three where it's real, really lithium, but I also made a tiny mistake guessing that there were more neutrons and protons in the human body. There's so much hydrogen and so much oxygen and carbon and so forth in the human body. There are slightly more protons than, than neutrons. But what I need right now is just the fact that mostly I am made of protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? That's true for a very, very good approximation, likewise for the pen. So if the rules of quantum field theory are true, the force that I can possibly um, exert on another macroscopic object can be thought of as what is the force between the electrons, between electrons and protons, electrons and neutrons, protons and neutrons, etc. There's, there's a finite number of different things that can happen, okay? And then what you can do is take objects of different compositions and move them close to each other, big macroscopic hunking things, you know, like kilometers uh, of mass, bring them very, very close, you know, like centimeters, millimeters, even tinier than that, and say, what are the forces? You can certainly detect gravity that way, right? The Cavendish experiment does this. So you want to make the Cavendish experiment, but much, much um, stronger. And you want, to, you want to be able to sort of look for forces over and above the force of gravity. So there's a famous set of experiments using torsion balances and things like that. And so for the first, I think for the first time, I'm not sure, but for the first time, I, as far as I can remember, in the Biggest Ideas videos, I'm gonna show you data, okay? Here we have actual uh, constraints from experiments on new forces of nature. And they basically depend on two things. How strong is the force and what is the range of the force? And what you see is uh, the vertical axis is how strong, the horizontal axis is uh, what is the range. And what you see is what is ruled out are forces in the upper right. That is when either the range is, strong, is big or the, the strength of the, of the force is strong. So the, the part of the graph where you're allowed, where there could be a force but we haven't yet detected it,
is either because the force is very weak or because it's very short range. And if you look quantitatively at the plot, um, for a new force of nature to have not yet been discovered, if the strength of that force is approximately equal to the strength of gravity, then the range of that force has to be less than a millimeter. Okay. Now, if you think of it, that's, that's dead in the water right there in terms of everyday physics, because to have two things be close enough to be, you know, a millimeter across. Uh, so you need like millimeter sized objects. If they're bigger than that, then one end of the object is not exerting a force more than a millimeter away. Right. So you need to get things within a millimeter of each other that are actually causing the force. But the gravitational force between two objects of millimeter size is almost completely negligible. You know, it is completely negligible. You know, we feel gravity in the world because we're feeling the whole force of the Earth. But you don't feel the gravitational force of your refrigerator when you're in the kitchen. It's just far, far, far too weak. So this is saying that any new forces of nature either have to be much, much shorter range than gravity or much, much, much weaker than gravity. And either way, those two constraints say it's not going to be relevant to everyday physics. So we have been looking for new forces that could be relevant. We have not found them. We have ruled them out. And there, this is a slightly older plot, but there are even better constraints now than there used to be. So the data are important. The data are in. It's good to be able to show some experimental results here in the Biggest Ideas videos. Um, the laws of physics underlying our everyday lives are completely known. We know what they are. There's plenty to be done, plenty to be done taking those laws of physics and applying them to things. Quantum computing would be one example of that. But then again, so would chemistry. So would sociology or economics, right? You know, these are all different ways that the laws of physics play out. And there's plenty more to be done, nowhere near answering all the interesting questions that we can think of to ask.